Hello, welcome to Star Wars Headlines. Rebecca is sick today, uh, so the union sent me. Uh, my name is Alex, <laughs> and as always, we've got Mike Celestino, our Star Wars expert. How's everything Hi. going, Mike? I had like a roller coaster morning. Where I was like depressed this morning, and then I, I conducted an interview for my podcast, and I was so geek geeked out and like giddy by the end of it. I was like super excited. So, and then I got sad about my old cat who died a couple years ago. So it's it's been like <laughs> a roller coaster you? morning, literally. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I'm, I'm good. Are you able to talk a little bit about the interview that's coming to Who's the Boss? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, well, so Siren just passed by. Sorry. Um, I'm, as you may know, on Who's the Boss, the, Who's the Boss this year, which is the Star Wars podcast from Laughing Place, um, I'm doing a Lucasfilm retrospective for the 50th anniversary of the company. It was founded in 1971 with the release of THX 1138. So, throughout the whole year, I'm uh, doing a retrospective of every major project that the company was involved with, starting with THX and then going all the way through to Strange Magic, which is the last thing I think that was developed under the George Lucas era before he sold the company to Disney. Um, so this next week is going to be, we're up to more American Graffiti, which is the sequel to American Graffiti, which I had never seen before until this week. But uh, I was looking for somebody to come on and talk about that movie, which is like, fairly obscure not a lot of people really talk about this one but i found this guy through my friends at another star wars podcast called uh, skywalking through neverland they hooked me up with this guy mark marshall who is a, a producer uh, he's a film producer but he also he got his start as a production assistant on more american graffiti so we talked all about that but then i found out he was steven spielberg's personal assistant like through the first half of the 80s and during the production of the Goonies, uh, which Steven Spielberg was a producer on, um, he was he was known as the Goonie Wrangler. It was like his job to like make sure all the kids were where they needed to be. So I ended up talking to him about the Goonies for like ten minutes on top of all this other you know Lucasfilm stuff. And I was like, it was so so nice to me. He invited me to go to the uh, the Goonies fortieth anniversary, which is, I won't be for four years, but, um, they, they have this thing every, every anniversary, every five years, I guess they do it up at Astoria, Oregon, where part of the film was shot. So, uh, in four years, you can catch me there. Wow. But I was just, I was giddy about the Goonies this morning, which has nothing to do with Star Wars, almost nothing. <laughs> and I just found out Goonies is on HBO Max. So I just added that to my queue this morning. Um, as uh, I yeah, I can't get enough of the Goonies. That's one of the movies where like, I feel like if you grew up on it, you love it. And then if you watched it later in life, you probably don't care at all. <laughs> eh, I don't know. I want to say Benji hasn't seen it. So now that it's on HBO Max, I feel like we got to watch it one of these nights. Um, but that's okay. I, think, I think there's enough crossover that any Star Wars fan will forgive a 10 minute um, diversion into <laughs> Goonies fandom. Well, that's um, what then, I try to do on the podcast too, is it, it's mostly about Star Wars, especially this year though, I'm trying to, talk about some other stuff with the whole Lucasfilm retrospective. And then at the end of every episode, we talk about other media that we're consuming. Cause I, I, you know, I say star Wars is the center of my pop culture universe. And then I just consume stuff all, all day long, every day to stave off the, the ennui. <laughs> yeah. And with, um, have you, with American graffiti, have you, you've been to San Francisco before, but have you been to the original Mel's where they filmed American graffiti? I have not been to the original Mills. I used to eat at Mills Drive in around the corner from my old apartment in Hollywood a lot. And I've been to the one in West Hollywood. And I know that there's one in Universal Studios Hollywood, obviously. And then um, uh, I know there's some in the Bay Area, but I've never been to the original one, no. The original one, like the artwork on the walls, is a lot of behind the scenes footage of production on the first American Graffiti. I don't know if more American Graffiti filmed there too, but what really struck me was they have a little glass case where you check out and they were selling sun bleached VHS copies of American Graffiti for like $5 and I wanted to buy one, but I didn't know what to do with it. It would have just gotten more sun bleached at home. Um, but it was uh, just like watching, like walking into Blockbuster and like the oldest movie covers were like right. very faded. <laughs> to answer your it. question, uh, no, there there are no scenes at the in the second movie that take place in uh, in Mel's Drive-In. Donna, oh. Donna says that her cousin was a an extra. Mm. 
That's really in, cool. In, in which movie, Don? In the first one or the second one? They filmed all night. And uh, George Lucas lives right over there near Marin County. I think he's technically not in it. Uh, but are you ready to dive into our first? I am. I, I want to give you one more fun tidbit about American Graffiti. <laughs> oh, sure. I'm like putting off Star Wars talk as much as possible. <laughs> um, the first American Graffiti movie takes place in Modesto, California, but it was not shot in Modesto. It was shot in Petaluma, California. The second movie, part of the second movie takes place in Vietnam, and the Vietnam sequences were shot in Modesto, California. I found that to be very funny. That was something I learned, something I learned during the interview. Oh, wow. That is... Uh... That's very interesting. <laughs> Donna, Donna said the first movie is what she was talking about. So. Oh, cool. All right. Let's now it's time for, time to talk about Star Wars. All right. Let me <laughs> get this going. And give me just one moment, because when I when I do this, I lose half my screen. Uh, this is the first thing we wanted to talk about, right? The first headline. Yes. So, uh, OK, great. So if you might know, as you might know, the former Rainforest Cafe building at downtown Disney District and Disneyland Resort is currently being transformed into the Star Wars Trading Post, which is now housed in the old Wonderground Gallery shop, which is going to become Wonderground Gallery again in the shop. The Star Wars stuff is moving over here. Uh, and you can see they've added a bunch of props and decorations, the satellite dishes and weird little gizmos and electronic panels and things like that. And that sign covered by the canvas tarp there is uh, they've actually released a photo of the sign on the Disney Parks blog, but it says Star Wars Trading Post. And then they've announced now earlier this week that uh, on February 19th, this is going to open up to the to guests. But if you're a legacy annual pass holder at Disneyland Resort, which means that you held uh, an active annual pass when the parks shut down in March of last year, you're a legacy pass holder. You can go and preview this on uh three days earlier on february 16th but you got to sign up for a reservation which i think are going to be available this coming tuesday the 9th so you can go to the disneyland.com website and compete with me to get a spot uh <laughs> to be among the first people to check out this very cool looking uh, and a great use of this space because it, it reminds me so much of like the masasi temples on yavin in the first star wars film uh, and and since uh since i took these photographs they have installed Ray's speeder out front, which it's going to be like to the right where they used to do the parrots shows or whatever out there in downtown Disney um, on that little stage there. That, that'll be a photo op. And uh, it just looks really cool. I think it's such a great idea. This building has just sat unoccupied for a couple years now since the Rainforest Cafe shut down. Well, and, uh, in addition to those Star Wars worlds, it also looks like Machu Picchu. Um, and and right. I know you get your perk as a Disneyland uh, legacy pass holder. Me as a Landry's as a Landry's Select Club uh, member, do I get priority seating without a reservation? Wait, what, what's the land? Oh, that's oh, for the rain. So that was Rainforest Cafe's parent okay. company, Landry's. <laughs> and if you join one of the perks, you pay like $20 for like a lifetime membership. And one of the perks is you can go to any Landry's location, which includes Bubba Gump's and at Disney World T-Rex um, and Yak and Yeti and Animal Kingdom. And you don't have to have a reservation. And they like bump you up to top priority to be seated next, like a king. So I just assumed I used it once at, at Universal Hollywood. I'd never been to a Bubba Gump before, but um, <laughs> we were really hungry and there was like a 30 minute wait. And I was like, I'm Landry Select. And they took us right in. OK, I, I didn't know about that program. So pretty but... powerful. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I'm excited to see what they've done inside of here and, and especially to find out like how much of the building they're using, like how far back is the actual shop? Mm. Gonna go because it's a big space in the inside the rainforest cafe there. And those doors were the entrance to the rainforest cafe gift shop, right? Like the restaurant entrance was around the corner, if I remember correctly. Maybe originally, but certainly bef in the years before it closed, you would go in through these doors, and and the bar was on the left. If you went straight, you'd go into the restaurant. There was like the host table on the left there too, and then if you went right, you would go into the gift shop. Okay. Interesting. Um, are, is there anything else you want to talk about, Rainforest? No, I, I just, I think, uh, you know, check it out February 19th if you're a regular guest. Well, and if you're like me and you can't get there, I'm assuming you will have covered oh, yeah. 
on Laughing Place and possibly video coming to YouTube. Yeah, and Parker wanted to ask uh, what will be in the old trading post. If you mean the the shop that was the Wonderground Gallery, that's going to become the Wonderground Gallery again. So people were complaining that that shop had gone away. So they're bringing that back. I, I always liked that shop, so I'm glad that's coming back. We're getting it back. It was and weird. Yeah, had... Sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say they had a couple of product releases like right after they switched the Wonderground Gallery over to the Star Wars Trading Post that were Wonderground Gallery branded, like that Walt uh, 65th anniversary figure. Yes. <laughs> right. Uh, but yeah, uh, if you want to, if you're unable to go to the park or to the resort like Alex and you want to follow up on this news and when uh, Star Wars Trading Post opens in the old Rainforest Cafe, Pay attention to laughingplace.com and the Laughing Place YouTube channel and the Twitter feed and, and everything, all the social media. I'll be there as soon as I can, and we'll have as thorough coverage as I can get up. Great. Very exciting. Next, we've got a special magic moment that happened for Star Wars fans out at uh, Disney World. Yeah, so apparently they do this every once in a while. And this is, I was joking on the... Disney Parks chat that we do here on the YouTube channel that um, they always say like Star Wars fans got together at Walt Disney World for this lightsaber meetup. But then I was like, I'm a Star Wars fan and I didn't I didn't hear anything about this. How did people find out about this kind of thing? Um, and not that I live in Florida, so I wouldn't have been able to go anyway. But I, I just wonder, I must be on Facebook or something because I don't have a Facebook anymore. But uh, these people all brought their lightsabers to Batu down there at Disney's Hollywood Studios and had their photo taken in front of the Millennium Falcon. And then, uh, so that was fun. And then they also revealed one of the new lightsabers coming to Doc Ondar's Den of Antiquities, which is Cal Kestis's lightsaber from the Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order video game. And the last time that I remember they did one of these, I think Ashley Eckstein um, initiated it and they debuted the Ahsoka Tano lightsaber, which they had previously announced, but they suddenly made it available for sale that night. Is that correct? I'm not sure when it went on sale, but yes, I do. I think she was there signing the the hilts and stuff. So yeah, that was cool of of Ashley Eckstein from the Clone Wars, the voice of Ahsoka Tano to, to do that uh, at, at Walt Disney World. Um, we got a couple more comments here. Uh, Donna wanted to know if there's a chance of them putting a restaurant into the rainforest cafe, I think. So I, I was saying earlier, I actually like the idea of this maybe becoming a permanent thing, this Star Wars trading post, even after the parks reopen. I think it's a good place to house Star Wars stuff in downtown Disney. So uh, I don't know. I don't know if there's going to be a plan for them to make it into a restaurant again. Maybe you can make it a Star Wars restaurant like they were planning for Galaxy's Edge but didn't get installed, that like dinner and a show type thing. And that um, those plans at Disneyland, do they still have the land for it? Or is it your understanding that like that space is no longer available to expand that restaurant concept? Uh, I could be wrong, but I believe that area is still like backstage behind Galaxy's Edge. I think I've I've been back there. I was back there actually for the media event for Galaxy's Edge and they had like a little warehouse that's still back there where we had our lunch or whatever. So I think there's still space to expand that a little bit if they're willing to move that somewhere else. Um, mm. So I think it's possible that it could, if if Galaxy's Edge proves successful enough in the future after everything reopens, I think it's possible. I think at least Uga's Cantina is, is an indication that um, people want that kind of immersive dining experience. Yeah, there's there's also the area that has the uh, overflow line for the Millennium Falcon attraction, which is like right. It's so weird because it totally ruins the immersion when you go back there. Mm -hmm. But it's like a bunch of like crates stacked up behind uh, that um, docking bay area or whatever. So maybe the yeah. same crates that they use to ship shop Disney their uh, Galaxy's Edge. Right. Yeah, it could, right. be, could be in, in universe story. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so next we've got um, something that I'm really excited for as as a big fan of of Life Day and the holidays, uh, the Life Day Treasury holiday stories from a galaxy far, far away. Yeah, it's funny. This past year, 2020, was the first year that I ever really celebrated a Life Day because we did we made a big deal about it on LaughingPlace.com because. 
you know, everything was shut down. We didn't have anything else to talk about. So we, we really made a big deal of Life Day, which is the fictional holiday established in the Star Wars holiday special, which is, it, it wasn't canon for a while. And now it's back to being canon because people keep mentioning it in The Mandalorian and Galaxy's Edge and stuff like that. And now they've announced this uh, short story collection that's going to be a bunch of different stories from around the Star Wars galaxy written by... Uh, our pal Kevin Scott, who's been on my podcast, and George Mann, who's been on my podcast. And uh, they've written, Kevin Scott's writing a bunch of High Republic stuff. Um, he wrote the Dooku Jedi Lost audio drama thing. And uh, George Mann wrote uh, the Dark Legends short story collection. So th they both have experience in Star Wars. And I think this is going to be a, a lot of fun. Like you said, I'm very excited about this as well. And I have a feeling when this comes out this fall, I think it's coming out in September, so you'll have a couple months because Life Day is November 17th, the anniversary of the holiday special. So you'll have a couple months to read it, and then we'll have a big, uh, we'll have a really big Life Day celebration this year because hopefully, crossing my fingers, hopefully we'll be able to celebrate uh, in person, maybe on Batu. This this is the image that really excited me because I own um, two Ewoks, and uh, <laughs> just, just love these little guys. <laughs> Yeah, it looks fun. I love the artwork too, and I'm I'm blanking on the name of this artist, but he did the art for George Mann's other two uh, Star Wars short story collections as well. But yeah. a great, great, like evocative, um, atmospheric artwork there. And uh, just going on the theme of potentially making the old Rainforest Cafe a restaurant or bringing a restaurant to Galaxy's Edge, I would love to have. Um, I'm drawing a blank on the character name, but the chef with four arms doing the cooking tutorial oh, in Star Wars Holiday. Uh, yeah. I don't remember that character's name either. This um, would be fun to have have her there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Grant Grant Griffin is the artist there. I saw it in the synopsis. Oh, great. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. Uh, well, looking that. forward to that. What's the, the, what's the date? September 17th or September yeah. 7th. Sorry. September 7th, 2021. Okay. Um, all subject to change. I know I've seen a lot of book release dates get um, moved around a little bit, but it's not, yeah. a, it's not uncommon for holiday books to publish in the early fall so yeah and this one they they got to have it out before life day this year oh yeah so. yeah you need it at least <laughs> digitally so next we're diving oh, yeah. into the world of comics is this the this, one you want to start with yeah this was a big week for star wars comics there were actually four released and i reviewed three of them on laughingplace.com because i don't read and i haven't reviewed the idw star wars adventures comic that's a little geared more toward kids, but I did review the new issue of the main Star Wars title from Marvel, and this is continuing. It, it's set between The Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi right now, and uh, you know, obviously Han's out of the picture because he's frozen in carbonite, but this is all about Leia and Lando Calrissian. Luke was not in this issue at all, um, and then you've also got this a squadron of starfighters called the Starlight Squadron, which is a reference to the High Republic. So they're kind of tie tying everything in right now. And the Starlight Squadron is off fighting uh, the Empire. They come across that Star Destroyer that you see there on the cover. And then back at the Rebel fleet, there's this like very tense showdown between Lando and Leia and C-3PO involving Lando's pal Lobot. Um, and yeah, this is written by Charles Sewell. He has a great track record with Star Wars already, and he, he's doing a great job with the main Star Wars title. I never really have any complaints about his writing. So uh, the one thing that, you know what, I will give you a complaint. <laughs> this is my little pet peeve lately with the Star Wars comics. They they do different covers sometimes, right? So you have the main cover and you'll have the variant covers, and the variant covers won't have anything to do with the issue, which is fine. But with the main cover, which you just saw there at the top, you can see the Emperor, Emperor Palpatine, and Darth Vader on the cover, and they are not in this issue at all. So I feel like that's a little bit of false advertising. It always bugs me. The previous issue was even worse because the main character on the cover, I think the only character on the cover in number 10 was Luke Skywalker, and Luke was not in the issue at all. And I was like, wait, this isn't a st story about Luke. It's mostly about Leia and stuff right now, which is fine. Love to read about Leia and Lando, and and Charles Sewell writes Lando so well. But I, I want the cover to represent what's in the issue. Am I being too picky? Um, no, I I 
I agree. I mean, as a kid, th those kinds of things would bother me too. Um, really off tangent, but I remember getting a Muppet Babies VHS at Target and it had Miss Piggy on the cover as a mermaid. Like they were all diving underwater and like Kermit and the gang were in, you yeah. know, scuba gear, but M Piggy was a mermaid and it was like the height of Little Mermaid popularity. So I got it. So excited to see this Miss Piggy mermaid moment. And at no point in the episodes did she become a mermaid. So, I mean, yeah. I get it. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, there's so much fun stuff happening in these comics. They got to be able to find something to put on the cover that is representative of what you find inside and mostly this is that's commander zara she's the imperial officer that's like the villain of this arc and then the star destroyer the space battle is all in there it's just those other two characters don't show up so it kind of bugs me a little but does she uh, run that clothing store at disney springs <laughs> <laughs> wherever they can get in some synergy you know they're gonna they're gonna do it i want to see uh captain uniglo in one of the <laughs> future issues all right. This was my favorite of the three comics that I reviewed this week. This is Kevin Scott again, who we talked about earlier with that Life Day book. And um, this is issue number two of The High Republic, which I, I like The High Republic so far. I liked the novels, but the comic is really what's getting me jazzed about The High Republic. I love his writing. The story is very exciting it's, and the art is terrific. And I don't know, after this issue, I was like, oh, I can't wait to read some more. Plus, this guy on the cover here, his name is Skier, S-S-K-E-E-R. And he's a Trandoshan Jedi. He's the same species as my favorite character from the original trilogy, Bosk, who I named my podcast after. Um, and I just love him so much. And he's getting to be a little bit, uh, you know, spoiler alert, but he's getting to be a little bit tempted by the dark side, which I always find interesting you know i don't i don't want all these jedi to just be like goody two shoes you know i want some uh, interesting temptations and character developments going on there so this guy skier is turning out to be a, a standout for me among the jedi that we've been introduced to in the last uh, couple months with the high republic and he lost his arm in the novel and you can see him there with no arm but but the Trandoshans are like lizard men so they'll grow it back He'll, he'll grow his arm right back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I read the first uh, issue and loved it. And I haven't gotten to the second issue. I mean, it's been out for 24 hours, so give me a little time. Right, right. But, um, <laughs> but, it's great. Uh, it is. Yeah, it is great. And it kills me that it's monthly. That like, because I'm so used to digesting, you know, content weekly from TV. And so yeah. I like the next week I was like, where's this issue? I was like, oh, wait, I have to wait a whole month? Well, the great thing about what they're doing with Star Wars right now is there's so many titles. There's five titles from Marvel that are running right now, mm -hmm. and then two from IDW. So pretty much every week, there's at least one new Star Wars comic. Uh, I think there are a couple exceptions coming up where there are no comics coming out in a couple weeks. But um, yeah, you got Star Wars, Darth Vader, Doctor Afra, Bounty Hunters, Star Wars Adventures, High Republic, High Republic Adventures, and then uh, whatever else. Yeah, they, they do a couple fun things every once in a while that are like one shots or whatever. But yeah, so much, so much good stuff. And then the third one we should talk about today is um, the other High Republic title. This one's from IDW, and this is the one that's going to be targeted at a little bit of a younger audience. It's called the High Republic Adventures, and this is where uh, Yoda is actually going to be featured more than in the other High Republic stories. So Yoda is off with a bunch of younglings, uh, some Padawans. He's training them. They're going on like uh, excursions, like training to be Jedi, like learn on the job type things. And um, they come across uh, fallout from this thing called the Great Disaster, which is covered in the main storyline of the High Republic. If you read the Light of the Jedi novel by Charles Sewell. Um, but uh, yeah, this is focusing on Yoda and his Padawans as they try to help people out affected by this disaster. And I thought it was a good start. This is written by Daniel Jose Older. I'm not the biggest fan of his other Star Wars stuff, but I thought this was probably the best of what I've read of his stuff so far. So uh, I thought it got off to a pretty good start. But again, it's targeted more toward a younger crowd and it, it focuses on the younger characters. So um, if you're looking to get your maybe young adult into the High Republic, this might be a good place to start. Nice. Very exciting. And then you have done some deep diving. Yeah. So uh, uh, 
I, I wanted to include this because I, I was so proud when I noticed this. Let, let's not scroll down past that just sure. yet. Um, but I want to I want to preface this by saying, like, if you haven't read Star Wars Into the Dark, the new High Republic novel by Claudia Gray, I, I noticed this connection here to one of the comic books that had come out recently. And I, I was so jazzed when I read it. And then I, I had had like an advanced copy of the novel a couple of months ago, and I had to wait a couple months to talk about this, but I was so excited. And when the book came out, I wrote up this post. Um, but yeah, it's just kind of this little Easter egg connection that I just wanted to point out. So if you do care, you can stop watching now. But if, you, if you're if you interested to find out what I'm talking about, we'll, we'll keep going here. So um, in the novel, they come across this like abandoned ancient space station. And with the description, as soon as I read the description, I jumped up to my comic collection, I was like, I know what they're talking about here. I recognize this place. And um, it turns out that it was introduced much uh, about a year earlier in our timeline, but much like a couple hundred years later in the Star Wars timeline, we visit the same place in the Rise of Kylo, Kylo Ren comic book. And it's where Snoke is hanging out um, and kind of mentoring Kylo Ren. So They've planted this seed because Charles Sewell wrote the comic book and and he's involved with the High Republic. Claudia Gray wrote the novel, but they're they're working all this stuff. They're tying all this stuff together. And I really like that about the current state of Star Wars storytelling between all the books and comics and movies and TV shows. And it's all cross referential. Um, but, yeah, you can see that throne there. They talk about finding that throne in the novel. And then obviously much later on, Snoke chooses this place as his like base of operations. So uh, yeah, if you're into that kind of deep, deep connections between all the different eras of Star Wars and Star Wars lore, read both of those things, The Rise of Kylo Ren and uh, High Republic Into the Dark, the new novel from Claudia Gray. Nice. That's exciting. It's always fun when they find a way to tie your, your fandom together in multiple ways. Yeah. Uh, now, this was Rosario Dar Dawson sharing something on her Instagram. Um, I haven't seen these. Should I play the videos? Yeah, so this it's just her sitting in the makeup chair. There's two videos, and it's her getting prepped to play Ahsoka Tano in uh, Mandalorian Season 2. And, you know, it was, it was very secretive, uh, her appearance in Season 2, although it had kind of leaked through the Hollywood trade publications and stuff, which is a bummer. But... Um, it's neat to see how they go about putting on her makeup here. And there's a second one. Oh, yeah, there you go. I thought the second one had her putting on the. I think it does because okay. the, end, the end, end frame looks like that. <laughs> right okay, yeah. So this is like really the final product with putting on the contact lenses and everything. But, yeah, it's just another cool peek kind of behind the scenes. I like the Herman Munster in the background as kind of like their their hmm. prosthetic spirit guide. I hadn't even noticed that, but that's really funny. Yeah. <laughs> that's pretty good. And then speaking of The Mandalorian, uh, we found out that it has been nominated for the best TV drama, drama. drama TV series at it's the Golden way Globe. way down here. We got all the Disney <laughs> ones. Here we go. So what's the competition? I we got uh, in the category, The Crown from Netflix, Lovecraft, Lovecraft Country from HBO Max, Ozark from Netflix and Ratchet, which is Netflix, but produced by Fox 21 television studios. So if, if Mandalorian doesn't win, we want it to be at least be Ratchet. I said earlier that I, I do nothing but consume media, but I have seen almost none of these other shows. I saw half of the first season of Lovecraft country, but I have not, not watched the crown. I've not watched Ozark and I not, I have not watched Ratched, which is a spinoff of the movie One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Have mm. you watched any of these, Alex? I have watched uh, the first two seasons of The Crown. I'm, I'm a little behind on all things Netflix, but um, I, I do enjoy it. And my understanding is this past season dives into the 90s and uh, particularly the um, introduction and death of Princess Diana. So I think that drew a big uh, audience for Netflix on, on that season. Okay, well, I'm sure they're all good, but uh, we're we're rooting for for Disney Plus and The Mandalorian there. Absolutely, yeah. If, sure. That's that's the one I think everybody watching the stream probably wants to win. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> so that was the one Star Wars uh, Golden Globe, but also I think the one Star Wars video media content from 2020, right? Yeah, the, 
Well, certainly the only live action. We had uh, the Clone Wars. Uh, oh, that's right. The season animated. seven. Yeah. Grand finale. Right. <laughs> right. Disney has released new Amazon Kids Plus voice skills, which I don't even understand half of I, that. Okay. I was looking over this earlier and I could not figure out what this is or what it means. And it made me feel very, very old. <laughs> I was like, okay, it's a frozen sing along thing. Fine. But then C3PO translates and it said, like, C3PO will teach you how to speak Wookiee or something. Like, I didn't know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I don't get what this is. I don't know. If you want to look into it more, maybe you can figure it out. What do you think, Alex? Do you have any inkling of what this is? I'm going to guess. Disney has released new Amazon. I don't even know what Amazon Kids Plus voice skills would be. I'm guessing it's through Alexa. And I'm, I'm guessing the Frozen thing is just play uh play uh in summer and without the lyrics and give me the words a c3po translates i'm gonna guess you can make noises and he will pick like random uh eight ball style <laughs> anthony daniels got yeah. paid a little bit of money to <laughs> record some new lines um yeah i don't i don't know i don't get it but you can look into it uh yeah Mac so frozen frozen sing you can choose over 10 songs from both frozen films uh, C-3PO and SD-89 will teach kids key phrases in Shrywook, Shrywook. Which is, yeah, which is the Wookiee language. And droid speak. Yeah. You can then speak to characters like Chewbacca, R2-D2, BB-8, okay. and more. Fair enough. Uh, Mac, our, our pal Mike Mac wanted to say that uh, the man he's okay with the Mandalorian winning this year, but next year there's going to be some Marvel competition. You got a lot of Marvel shows, WandaVision. Falcon and the Falcon. Winter Soldier, uh, Loki coming up. What if? So yeah, uh, I'm sure that will be the case. Yeah, I think I think Wandavision, based on critical uh, reviews, is probably a likely likely. You know one. what? You know what? I love I love when critics love a show and the audience just hates it. <laughs> yeah. Well, and there's Which... been I mean, there's been so many mixed like fan responses on Twitter to Wandavision. I think yes. last week's episode changed people's tune i know and i had the exact opposite reaction because i was into it until last week's until episode. Last week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. i i liked it until it became more marvel and i was like oh well this is just marvel again and it's like uh, i loved the uh, the weird eerie creepy sitcom episodes and everyone I, I else think, seemed to hate that i think mac <laughs> probably clicked by on the stream <laughs> and, um, i am really looking forward to tomorrow's episode because i'm hoping we get back into the sitcom where it left off because yeah. i was really waiting for the 80s and particularly i i think we had heard of um potentially a full house um style guest star to tie into the olsen twins and and uh mm. their sister playing we'll Wanda. See, we'll see i'm looking forward to that as well yeah so now back into video games for Star Wars Squadrons fans. Um, this is on the Amazon theme as well. I like the way you've laid out uh, these things. I don't know if that was intentional or not. Uh, not the Amazon connection. No, I didn't know. Well, this that. you have to be a um, you have to be a Prime Gaming member to get, and then you can get it into your um, Star Wars Squadrons video game um, by connecting. I think your PlayStation account to Prime Gaming. Okay. Um, I'm not a big gamer, so I don't really know all of these. I'm a casual gamer, and I don't know about connecting it to your Prime account. But again, I'm very old. <laughs> uh, you're not that much older than me, so um, <laughs> you can drop the very, please. <laughs> uh, but yes, yeah, so you can get these new helmets. Um, do these uh, speak to you in any way? Like, do these scream something you've seen before in the Star Wars universe, or is this just new? deco that um is probably just unique to the game because it looks cool well i'll say that i i played through the single player missions on star wars squadrons and i, I enjoyed it but i have never played the multiplayer which is i think where this would come into play and also what strikes me odd about the helmets is that the game is a first person perspective you never see the i guess you would see your character in like the select screen or something where it's standing there before you start the mission but while you're flying you wouldn't see the character so it's odd that you would want to customize the helmet that much but yeah i think i don't know uh is there a place where other people can see you 
I guess just... when they fly past you, they might see you through the cockpit if it's that detailed. But again, okay. I haven't played the multiplayer because again, I, I am an old person. I don't like interacting. <laughs> this is I'm imagining like teenagers yelling at me in my headset and stuff. And I know I've, I have siblings who really like um, things like Grand Theft Auto and just the like open world version where they can like have their own houses and stuff and um, spend a lot of in-game money uh, credits on yeah. uh, making their character look as cool as possible. So I was wondering if that's what this was really for. Yeah. Uh, well, I think they, they did make an effort with squadrons to not make you buy extra stuff. I know this mm -hmm. has been a controversy in the video game world for years with these things called micro transactions where like, Oh, you want this weapon, you got to spend two fifty or whatever. Now, all the bonus content for squadrons has been a, a free add on, which is great. They've been they've added ships, they've added costumes, they've added little dangly things you hang in the cockpit and stuff, which is you would actually see because it's the first person view. Yeah, here you see the probe <laughs> you, droid and the sabacta. Yeah, and the dice. I have those dice hanging from my mirror in my uh, car. Because were you there at the solo junket? I didn't do solo. I did Rogue One, and then solo was. I can't remember why I didn't do solo, but who, I didn't. Who, do solo. who did Laughing Place send to that? It might have been, might have been Benji, might have even been Jeremiah. I want to say uh, it was, it was I was traveling, which was why yeah. I couldn't go to solo. Oh, yeah, well, they they gave us those dice, which was before they were available for sale or whatever. But now you can get them at Galaxy's Edge. But um, yeah, now you can put them in your cockpit uh, for squadrons. Yeah, I think it's it's pretty neat. But again, I I haven't picked up the game since the fall when it came out. I'm sad you to can, say you can play Sabak or at least lay your Sabak deck out. Yep, nice look. That looks like, actually looks like the box of the yeah. Sabak deck that you get in Galaxy's Edge. Yep, it's pretty cool. So that's everything for Star Wars Squadron. Star Wars Mission Fleet uh, is a new animated short shows. Uh, do we want to play this video? This Is this a trailer? Yeah, I think you can play a little bit of it. So um, Mission Fleet is... Little Star Wars action figures from Hasbro. Oh, maybe you want to mute it. Yeah. Um, they're smaller than the six inch ones, but I think they're maybe a little bigger than the three and three quarter inch ones. And they're for younger kids. They sent me a couple of those to review. If you go and look uh, on YouTube for Mandalorian toys, I reviewed a couple of the Mission Fleet ones, and they're fun toys. But now that you've got a little animated short starring Din Jaren and Lil Grogu. Uh, fighting against some stormtroopers, and then IG Eleven shows up. I guess it's just to promote the toys. It's it's pretty fun. Yeah, well, and, and I mean that's really big right now for kids, especially is um, you know having web content that goes along with their toys. You're seeing that more and more with even just original toy series. Um, and I think it's Moose Toys does the uh, Treasure X Hunters, and they have like a whole web series to go along with the things you can find in your little dig kits. Uh, have they announced anything like a second wave of figures from this Hasbro collection? Right around now is when Toy Fair historically would be. I don't know. Did we skip the Hasbro? I forget when when that was coming up in the um, sequence of things. But there was a there were some announcements from Hasbro this week. Let me see if I missed that. Okay, um, but yeah, I don't. I'm not sure about another wave of the Mission Fleet. New um, Hasbro toy announcements. Yes, I did miss it. Give me just a moment to get it. Okay. Over. Well, I'll just yeah. introduce it by saying um, Hasbro has been doing this thing called Fan First Fridays every once in a while, where they where they'll will they will reveal some new upcoming Star Wars action figures. They, they do it for Marvel as well. But uh, this past week, we learned about some new figures coming from the Clone Wars, from the Bad Batch animated series, and Return of the Jedi and stuff. So if you scroll down there. Uh, we can go through the individual announcements. Uh, oh, so these are in celebration of Lucasfilm's 50th anniversary. And they are the six inch black series figures with the same molds that they've re released before, but they painted them to look like the original Kenner Star Wars action figure. So Greedo is painted to look like the incorrect colors that were on the original toy. And same thing with Obi-Wan there. And he's got that like vinyl cape that would have been on the original Obi-Wan figure, which is fun. And then the Jawa has the cape, the cloth cape from the original figure. So they have the similar mold that we've seen recently, but different paint schemes and stuff. 
Yeah, that yeah, Alec Guinness would not have looked as much like Alec Guinness. <laughs> right, <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then from uh, the vintage collection, which is the three and three quarter inch scale, there's uh, Leia with the poncho from Endor, which is fun. And then what's next? Uh, Paplu, the Ewok. Paplu. <laughs> and an ATST driver from Return of the Jedi coming up and then uh this is a re-release of qui-gon Jin in the six inch black series but it's now on a card back that represents what the old the f now old figures from 22 years ago when the when the phantom menace came out uh the smaller scale figures came on those uh style of card back same thing with the mace windu this is uh, super nostalgic for me because this was my uh, my younger siblings <laughs> era of Star Wars and um, they had all of this stuff. It came with those like little microchips with like yeah. one or two phrases. And I remember the one that was the most annoying was I'm a person and my name is Anakin. <laughs> yeah, you had to buy the the comm link thing <laughs> to play the microchips. The great thing about those were you could use them as stands like they had the little pegs on them mm -hmm. and it would fit in the character's feet yes uh, that's right we've also got darth maul from season seven of the clone wars and there was a ahsoka tano also from season seven there he's got the robot feet and then yeah uh, ahsoka as she looked in that most recent season on disney plus uh that's in the six inch black series line and then this is going to be from the bad batch which is the new animated series coming up later this year. And it's called the, what is it called? Elite, Elite Squad, Squad Trooper. Trooper. Yeah. <laughs> so yet another uh, trooper to buy and build up your, build up your troops. You can get as many of them as you'd like. <laughs> as Hasbro will like, will remind, remind you always. And then these figures were announced previously. These are actual members of the Bad Batch, but now they've revealed what the packaging is going to look like for the black series. And then they teased future black series characters, another bad, ba bad batch member. I think his name is tech. Then you got Ara Singh, the bounty hunter from the clone wars, right? <laughs> she first <laughs> appeared in, uh, I think she was first in attack of the clones or maybe not. Maybe she yeah. first showed up. Yeah. Uh, I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure it was episode two and yeah. uh, she and star Wars weekends um, at Hollywood studios would just kind of like lurk around and with those extended finger right. chip. <laughs> and so when I think of her, I just think of like being in line for something and her just kind of like walking <laughs> through with her crazy fingers. Right. Uh, oh, and then uh, in solo, a star Wars story, they revealed that uh, Woody Harrelson killed that character. So uh, off screen. <laughs> Maybe we'll see that eventually in some <laughs> ancillary material. The uh, third one there is uh, Zero, a droid from The Mandalorian, and also Casca Reeves, uh, another Mandalorian character from The Mandalorian. And finally, Lando Calrissian in his general uniform from Return of the Jedi, making his way to the Black Series. General smooth. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then the vintage collection, the smaller scale, is going to get IG-11 from The Mandalorian and Lando in his blue cloak from the Empire Strikes Back. Yeah. I do love it. <laughs> That's it from Fan First Friday from Hasbro. Awesome. Well, sorry, I. No, no problem. Before, but, uh, I, I mean, yeah. this was a better segue anyway, talking about the mission fleet into the Hasbro figures. And then cool. we've got uh, music from the video games Star Wars Battlefront and Battlefront 2 coming from Walt Disney records and i don't think this is on any physical media right it's just a download i believe it's digital only for now although the trend recently they did it with um the marvel spider-man and miles morales um video games for playstation um they ended up putting them out through mondo as vinyl exclusives and uh, my understanding is they both sold out really fast so if there's a lot of demand for this gordy hobb score um from these games i wouldn't yeah. be surprised if we saw a vinyl uh, release possibly through Mondo. Yeah, and uh, Mondo did the uh, Mandalorian as well. I got that nice. Oh, it's so nice. They, it's like an eight disc box set of all the vinyl scores from the first season of the Mandalorian. So who knows? We might see that. Uh, Mike Mack wanted to point out that Sasha Banks has a previous action figure from her time with the WWE, mm. and they didn't didn't just put the Mandalorian helmet on her. 
<laughs> well, we don't we don't know. Maybe they are just doing that. Did, did, did Hasbro, Hasbro make those? do those figures? Do they have <laughs> those molds? <laughs> uh, so, lastly, we've talked about it a little bit, but this is the uh, is this the newest episode of Who's the Boss? Yeah, the I put this out. Yeah, put this out yesterday. Um, and this, like I said, we're doing every major project this year that Lucasfilm uh, was involved with for its, for its first fifty years, or I guess the first however many years before Disney bought the company. And we actually, this week we got up to the original Star Wars film. So I invited uh, Trisha Barr, who's a contributor to StarWars.com. She's contributed to Star Wars Insider Magazine, and she founded the Fangirl blog as well. And uh, she's very knowledgeable about um, something I wanted to talk about called the the hero's journey, which is the the storytelling template built built around the ancient myths, the Greek myths and stuff that George Lucas used to craft the original Star Wars film. So we talk about that and uh, a, b a bunch of other stuff, the cast and why it was so successful uh, in the context of the late 1970s, you know, not not thinking about the whole franchise that came afterward in the sequels and stuff, just really focusing on that original film. Cool. I have a question, too, because you're going through, you know, obviously 50 years of Lucasfilm history, um, which was distributed through so many different companies. Do you have any kind of a guide anywhere of where who's the boss listeners can find and access these films in advance of the episode so they can kind of watch and listen along? That's a good question, because they are all well, most of them are available, but they are largely all available from different sources. Like, obviously, the Star Wars movies are on. Disney Plus, the American Graffiti films are on HBO Max right now, um, and THX 1138 is on HBO Max. Some of the other stuff, like Willow's on Disney Plus. Some stuff is only on YouTube, like the Droids and the Ewoks cartoons. We're going to talk about those, and then there are a few things where I'm not even sure if I'm going to be able to find them, but I'm looking into it. Uh, I do. I think I do mention in each episode where you can watch uh, this stuff. As far as in advance, I'm not. I haven't put together that guide and i haven't really looked into everything just I, di I did just buy the young indiana jones chronicles on dvd which i didn't mm. own but we're gonna have an episode dedicated to that with rebecca mostly later in the year so <clears throat> yeah it's all over the place some of it's uh, available for streaming some of it's not <laughs> Mike well, it's, an exciting, it's an exciting concept i'm, I'm really looking forward to yeah, thank you. Uh, ah. And you're, you're going to be on to talk about Return to Oz. Yes. And uh, Mike really Mack's going to be on to talk about Howard the Duck. So I got to answer his question by then <laughs> of where he can watch that. I'm not sure right now. It I has been available. Return to Oz. <laughs> oh, great. Well, <laughs> and Return to Oz is on Disney Plus, too. So yeah. uh, Howard the Duck has been on Netflix previously. I think it has been on HBO Max previously, too. So And Universal uh, owns it. So Peacock is a likely place for it to pop up. Good point never know <laughs> we'll see but yeah uh check back in every week who's the boss uh lucasfilm 50th anniversary retrospective all year wrapping up in november so stay tuned for more of that great anything else you wanted to share or talk about no i'm just showing off a different action figure every week and i, yeah. I got this uh kuwil the ugnot that is the way nick nolte <laughs> Very cool. Nick Very Nolte exciting. was not in the suit, by the way. <laughs> well, uh, my dogs, my dogs are literally barking, so we'll wrap it up. Thank you guys so much for watching uh, Star Wars headlines and uh, any other um, shows that we want to talk about coming up oh. later today. I think you have the list. I don't have the list. Do you have it? Yes, I do. Sorry if you can't hear me over this. Um, tomorrow at 9 a.m., Jeremiah is going to be streaming live from Magic Kingdom. Uh, at 11 a.m., this is all Pacific time. Mike, you will be at Downtown Disney um, yes. giving us a walk around there. And then uh, 11 a.m. on Saturday, Mike's also going to be at SeaWorld San Diego. And also on Saturday at 7.30 p.m., we have our um, typical Disney trivia live. But it's an extra special episode because uh, Doobie is turning 50 tomorrow. So you'll be seeing him one day after his 50th birthday on Disney Trivia Live. Awesome. Thanks, cool. Alex. Thanks yeah. for joining me today. Thank you for having me. Uh, and uh, everybody, Rebecca will be back next time. So you'll see a much prettier face on this side of the screen. <laughs>